So today I'm going to talk about navigating time and probability in event-driven knowledge graphs. And before I go into this time and probability, I'll say first something about our the, the approach that we have at France for knowledge graph and a unique approach. So, so what we offer is an event-driven knowledge graph as an intelligent graph on top of your enterprise data warehouse to data lake that learns over time. I mean, I think that's the shortest summary of what we do. How we do it is the interesting part, because basically what we do is we take very complex data yeah, and always turn it into events that are centered around entities. And the reason we do it is to make it at least 100 times easier to do reporting, ad hoc queries, and feature extraction for machine learning. Yeah. So that is the core message that I have for you today. And I see some people in the audience that have been following us for many years. And so they've probably read my papers about events and have seen um, earlier talks about events. But this is my current way of describing our anatomy of events or ontology, if you want to. Yeah. So events always have a type. Yeah. And I mean, intuitively, mostly people think an event is something that happens fast, a phone call, a meeting, a transaction, a sensor reading, whatever. Yeah. Slower would be a, a diagnostic session in the hospital, a medical procedure, a surgery, for example, or a test. But we're very liberal in our approach to events. So even a marriage is an event that has a start time and an end time, a relationship between the person and the company ownership. So even things that most people think of as relationships, we we turn into events, yeah? And because events usually are part of a hierarchy, for example, um, a phone call is a subclass of a meeting. If you want to deal with events, you also need some reasoning capabilities. Then another fixed thing for nearly every type of event that are acts, yeah? If you think of a phone call, there will be two. In the diagnostic setting, maybe two, two. You have a doctor and a patient. But if you have your crunch base, database, then you might have four investors in one investment round or meeting with a with a hundred. Yeah. Now in order to deal with events and actors, you need graph and social network analytics. And we actually have built that in in our knowledge graph. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about it today. Then events most of the time happen at a particular place. Um, so almost always our events have a geospatial locations. Sometimes you might even have multiple geospatial locations per event. Think of a phone call. Um, and then the two important ones I'm going to talk about today is uh, about temporal. So the events always have some kind of time, usually a start and an end time, sometimes maybe only one creation time. And what we're about is to avoid the idiocy of most enterprise data warehouses and data lakes and silos, yeah, to have literally hundreds and hundreds of ways to say something about time. We restrict ourselves to only having three predicates for time, yeah, so that we can offer a uniform way of dealing with time. The other thing is probabilistic. I mean, nothing is certain in life. So if I look at what we've been doing with knowledge graphs and events in the last two years, three years, nearly every event has a probability attack, uh, attached to it, yeah? Like a doctor can never be really certain if a patient says that he had bronchitis two weeks ago, yeah? Or in the intelligent agencies, you have phones, uh, um, maybe burner phones, and there's some probability that person X owns this particular phone P. And then, of course, you have predictions, future events, yeah? What is the probability that you will get a lung cancer given the preconditions that you have now? So we also come up have come up with a uniform way of dealing with probabilities. And finally, what we see uh, and what we deal with is that 80% of the events we deal with also have unstructured content attached, medical notes, investments, uh, CRM notes, and what, what have you. Yeah, for that, you have entity extraction and NLP. So anyway, this is, when I say event, I think about objects that have this anatomy. And by the way, uh, Maybe, Steve, you can mute. There's some, some sound in the background. Um, I'm going to hang up because my phone is acting up. It won't. It's going to hang up. All right. Okay. So today, I am uh, 
I mean, I can talk about each element of these events for a long, long time, so I'm only talking about the temporal part and the probabilistic part. Now, the events, I mean, for many years we've been working with events. Um, these knowledge graphs centered around events is something that we've been doing since 2011. We worked with several really big companies to come up with this unified events approach. We worked with a, a, a telecom company on a CRM system where everything that can happen to and with a, uh, a, a telephone customer as events. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we do with one of the biggest hospital chains in the U.S., uh, the Montefiore Hospital, what we do there with the events, and then I'm hardly going to say anything about what we do in intelligence, uh, but a little bit. Okay, so let's, let's talk about one use case of an event-driven knowledge graph. So we've been working since last in the last four years with uh, Montefiore, a hospital chain in the Bronx that has eight, eight I believe, nine, nine hospitals. Um, and and so we're together building this knowledge graph around patients. And uh, Intel really values our approach and is uh, helping us to get more visibility about our approach and, and helping in other ways. So the platform that we are making is something to support all the types of analytics that you see here. Yeah, I'm not going to explain any of them. I mean, I know that in the audience you have a picture with each of those in your mind. Yeah, but an issue that big hospitals have is that they want to do all of these things, but and they can hire companies to do any of these things. But the problem is that if they hire companies, say, to do predictive modeling, they will have to put a whole IT staff just to make sure that that company gets the right data that can go into um, uh, the analytics. So basically, hospitals are helping analytics companies with point solutions. We came up with an approach where everything that you ever might want to know about a patient is in one knowledge graph centered around patients. So anyone who wants to do any analytics can start within a day in most cases. So that is the whole idea behind our knowledge graph for healthcare. Yeah? And Beginning 2017, uh, we went in production where a system uh, detects um, a respiratory failure far better than doctors. It's a complex uh, random forest model. We're also using deep learning models where we have as an input 46 complex variables. And it's fairly obvious a doctor in general doesn't have time to look at 646 variables. But a computer can easily do that, and so that's why we actually are better than a doctor at predicting when you're going to get into trouble. Yeah, and this system, I mean, saves millions to millions per year, and it saves lives. So, and and we're working on now at least ten different use cases. One of them is to uh, recognize sepsis. Um, but again, this is not a talk about healthcare. I just want to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of that this is being used in practice. Okay, so now you want to build your own event-based knowledge graph. So, so what I have to do to kind of get a high-quality knowledge graph that will enable you to make it very, very easy to do machine learning and reporting and other queries. Well, I'm going to go into a few of these factors that you see here. One of them is to center everything around entities and events and to make sure that you build in your terminology and ontologies. <clears throat> and so I'm going to say a little bit about that. And then I'm going to say a little bit more about how we then deal with learning and predictions and how we found a systematic way to deal with that. And we talk about temporality. And we talk about how we model time and by temporality and how we visualize uh, the temporal buildup of event graphs. Yeah? And then I won't have time today to talk about the security that we do the visualization and the scalability part um, that will be something for future uh, uh, um, webcasts. So let me start with the, the, uh, what we mean when we say an event-based graph and what we mean by organizing everything around entities and events. Yeah. Before I go in there, I mean, you can, you can kind of imagine that almost anything in the enterprise can be turned into entities, yeah, a regular business has customers and products and healthcare as patients and clinicians and I can go down the list but I mean there's always an entity of interest in your particular enterprise yeah 
And then you want to do analytics over those what these entities do, yeah, or might want to do, or what you want to do to the to those entities. But it's really, really miserable, yeah, with the current systems. Somehow, what we see is data is not centered or modeled around entities, but we use a very antiquated model of tables and columns. So we think we're brainwashed into thinking that it's normal, that all the information about one patient actually could be in, say, 4,000 different tables and 20,000 columns. We do not think that it's weird, yeah? That if I want to get all the information about one patient out of the database, that I would have to write a SQL query to hit all those tables. Yeah? And, and just yeah, to add insult to injury here, is that the right way to saying that? Okay. <laughs> is, uh, if you just look like time, yeah, in the database that we know of, that we work with, there's more than 250 ways to talk about the fact that a particular thing happens at the start time or an end time or creation time. Yeah. And we think it's normal. Anyway, as a result of that, we that thing that's normal. It, the result is that in most enterprises, there's zero to five people that actually know the entire enterprise data warehouse structure. Yeah. It takes months and months to train a person how things fit together. Queries are really hard to write and very expensive. Yeah. And in the end, you don't get the reports or the analytics that you really need. So how do we fix this? Well, we, we created this complete radical simplification. We make sure that anything that can happen to an entity is turned into an event. So in healthcare, yeah, we have everything that happens to a patient. Yeah, so we have a check-in, a check-out, a test, a diagnosis, a procedure, medication, a sensor reading, a bill. Yeah, we have about we have a taxonomy of 350 types of events. Now, one type then of course could have many values. So there's a diagnostic event, but then you can have 20,000 or symptoms. Okay, but and and so basically what that means. Is that we go from thousands of tables actually to only one table, what we call the event table or the event graph. And now, hold your disbelief for a minute. Yeah, I'll get to the uh, to how this works in, in in a few minutes. Yeah, but I mean, this is the first thing that I'm trying to convince you of what we're doing here. Second thing is, um, if you build a knowledge graph and you don't build in all your terminology system, then you haven't achieved anything. Yeah. So for every domain that we work in, we use existing ontologies and taxonomies, or we build our own. So we know we can help people with building uh, ontologies. We can help people with building taxonomies. But in many cases, of course, you're well. Depending on the domain you're in, you can get lucky, and there's already nice sets available. So in healthcare, there's more than 600 terminology systems that are pretty reasonable quality. We have combined about 180 of those into one medical taxonomy system. So we took, say, something like MESH or SNOMED or a medication terminology system, and we cross-linked them together so that the word lung cancer in the medication taxonomy or MESH or SNOMED actually link sideways. We make sure there's only one way to go up and down the hierarchy tree. And we link the terminology system to things that happen in real life, like an ICD-9 or ICD-10 term, yeah, or a procedure code of a medication code. And now I get to the point where I said we can, I mean, you, you might think, are these guys crazy? How can you turn an ent entire enterprise data warehouse into events? Let me give you a simple example. Yeah? So here, um, you see how, well, I hope you can see my mouse here moving. Yeah, everything to the left of my mouse comes from the enterprise data warehouse or HL7 streams or other area or other things. Everything to the right comes from the terminology system. So, and think of it as trees. So, the event tree always starts with an entity. In this case, a person. And this person has an event of type outpatient encounter at a particular time, and this event has a sub-event of type patient diagnosis with the value allergy to peanuts. Now, what you see here is an ICD-9 concept. Yeah. 
But this ICD-9 concept can be mapped to these hundred, theoretically to these 180 taxonomy systems. Of course, LLG and peanuts won't happen everywhere. So anyway, we map the ICD-9 term to an indirection object with this LLG to peanuts, which is then linked to, say, a SNOMED term for LLG to peanuts, where we see that LLG to peanuts is a subclass of LLG to legumes, where LLG to legumes is a subclass or an a narrower than a food allergy, um, allergy to substance, all the way to allergic condition. Now, what you already understand probably if you are familiar with graphs, that if I ask in Sparkle, give me all patients with allergy to peanuts, I go back from here to the mapping object to the one ICD-9 code that talks about allergy to peanuts, and then I can find all the patients with that. But of course, I can also say, uh, give me all people with food allergy, and then I can go back in the tree and I will probably find 300 ICD-9 terms that say something about food allergy. And then I get a lot more patients. Yeah, because uh, in the US, uh, I, I think more than half the people have at least some allergy. Anyway, that is the, and of course, here you see outpatient encounter, but it also could be an invoice, yeah, or, or a medication administration or a test. Yeah, it's all, um, this thing can be any kind of event. And then, wh again, why did we do this? Well, say I want to do the query where we say, how many patients had gallbladder calculus in 2010 or later? Well, to say that in SQL, this is part one of three of the SQL statement on the enterprise data warehouse. Yeah, This is the Sparkle query that I have to do. Yeah, I just say, is there a person that has an encounter with a diagnosis that corresponds to a concept that matches gallbladder calculus, and the encounter happened at this time. Yeah, in our tool graph, our, our visual tool that comes with the Lego graph, you can actually draw these queries, and, they, and when I hit execute, they get translated in Sparkle, and that's what you get. But anyway, from 100 lines of SQL code to five lines of Sparkle code is not bad, even, and especially if you don't even have to write the Sparkle code. So this is why we do it, a very important slide, this. And then for the other companies, it's also important that they sometimes get all the information about one entity back. Well, if most people try to do that in the enterprise data warehouse, they won't even try. I can just do this one select X, yeah, for this particular patient, give me all the triples, and then I can choose if I get that object back as a JSON object or as a set of triples and I can work with it. In less than a second, I have that. And I write it in 10 seconds, and I have it in less than a second. Um, okay, so that's that's the main reason why we actually do all this. We turn this into events, yeah? And now let's go to the, the main course of what I promised that I would do. And that is um, talking about probability and learning. So when we do analytics, yeah? One of the cool things is that we take the output of our analytics and machine learning or statistics and put it back in the graph. Yeah. Now, you can do that today because, I mean, you can, we integrate with NIME, with Anaconda and Python, with R and Apache Spark. Yeah, so, if, by the way, if you want to work with uh, uh, Allegro Graph from Python and Anaconda, you just install a graph python and you're in. Um, and within um, a few days, we're going to publish a way so you can do Sparkle queries and turn them directly into Python Panda objects so that you can do directly your analytics on top of Sparkle. Yeah? Anyway, but the point is, we, we, we give you all these, up, uh, these capabilities, and then what we do in various settings is we store all the metadata about an analytic back in the graph, yeah, about the author, the date, the data set used, the language, the method, the script. We store entire scripts, yeah, even the version of R used, because, yeah, you want to be able to compare the analytics that you did now to an analytics that you did a year ago, and you want to know why is there a difference. Or you want to do further qu queries on top of your learned knowledge, yeah, so one thing we do is you have patients with type 2 diabetes, if you do topical analysis on that, on all the patients that have that, then you actually find there's 22 types of clusters of diabetes patients. 
So basically what we do is then we take the cluster number and add it back to each patient. And then we can do a, a follow-up query where we say, well, for patients that have diabetes and that have a cluster number X, see if they had this particular treatment and then look at which patients improved or uh, 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 declined, uh, sorry, and got worse. And then we can see what clusters yeah, were affected by a particular treatment. And you can find amazing new results. Yeah, but basically what we do is we do waves of queries on top of each other. Um, then we do a lot of predictions beforehand. I'm going to give you a little example in a minute. Yeah, and so we use we put results back so we can cache predictions, and then we make it. And then another thing is that, say you're a data scientist and you look at all the co-occurrences between certain things in your database. Well, you get an enormous matrix. And there are beautiful results in there, but you can't find them because you're looking at stupid tables. Yeah. So what we provide is a visualization to look at the output of, of, of your analytics. Yeah. So here's a simple example that I know some of the people in the audience have seen already. Yeah. And let me just actually give a, a regular demo about that. Um, so one thing we do in various domains, not only in healthcare, but also in logistics or telecom or CRM, yeah, is to take data sets, look for co-occurrences of certain events, compute how special those co-occurrences are, and then take the special co-occurrences and turn them back as a graph. So for example, you can look at the co-occurrence of every possible diagnostics in a large, a huge patient data set. So we actually have 3 million patients, 10 years of data. So what I can do is I can take all these diagnostics out. I can compute how many times someone has a left broken leg and a right blind eye or, or allergy to peanuts and dermatitis. Yeah. Now you get a number, then you correct that number for the frequency of the two things you're comparing. And then you get a number that call R ratio that tells you how special that co-occurrence is. So here, for example, this query says, okay, if I have allergy to peanuts, give me the top five other things that happen with allergy to peanuts. Yeah. And I can run the query and I find that if I have allergy to peanuts, and by the way, this is the Sparkle query that got written. This is the result. And I can, and then I see that if I have allergy to peanuts, then dermatitis due to food taken internally is 210 times higher than you might expect. Yeah, Asthma is 60 times higher than you might expect according to chance. Yeah, And then we get another dermatitis and uh, upper respiratory infections. I can take this, turn this into a graph. Yeah? So what you see here is, well, this, this, these, these blue things are ICD-9 terms. So I could click on the allergy to peanuts. Yeah, And what I would get from the database is, Okay, well here, oh, it was done. So here you see allergy to peanuts. Uh, you see the alternative label. You see it matches to something in to the taxonomy. So if I click on here, this encounter, I go to the, um, the match with the other objects. So anyway, we have allergy to peanuts. Yeah, we can see how it links to these. And you can actually also try to find the relationships. So we have a probabilistic space now. We can look for every ICD-9 term and see how it relates to other ICD-9 terms. And these objects themselves are, of course, also related to each other in maybe other ways in the database. So I can select the two predicates from 2 and 2, 5, and I can actually ask the database to find relationships between each of these various. Yeah, so we do a graph search for each pair of ICD-9 terms, and then you find a beautiful cluster um, around allergy to peanuts, yeah? And I could do it again, but I can do this now for almost 10,000 different um, billing codes in a hospital, yeah? I find the statistical network around it. So I could look at, um, say here, lecker housing. So one of the things that happens in hospitals is that if you get a homeless person, and in the Bronx you have a lot of them, and that person has needs antibiotics, then 
you have to give the person a shot and oh, sorry you, you want to give someone antibiotics but if they're homeless you better give them a shot and so you have to give them another term like a housing to justify why you gave them a shot yeah so the question is always so Let's look at lacquer housing, the top five things that go with that, and look at the relationships between those. And then I can find the links. And here you see, for example, a beautiful graph. Yeah, so remember, here's the query. What you see is you're asking for a graph. You do a Sparkle query. You get a beautiful graph. But of course, you can't see that graph unless you visualize it. And here, then I can look. And then you see that in the Bronx, the... Um, the thing that's most correlated with lack of housing is cocaine abuse or alcohol. Yeah? So anyway, that is one little example of how you take the output of analytics and turn it back into a graph. So now we're going to the follow-up here. Yeah. We do this for many, many different types. So for example, um, we do market basket analysis or association rules on diseases, yeah, so the data scientist in the audience knows that if you buy onions and potatoes, you're probably also going to buy burgers. In healthcare, it means if I have acute kidney failure and severe sepsis, I'll probably get unspecified septicemia. And if I have this and acute respiratory, uh, sorry, and septic shock, then I probably stop breathing, yeah. So think of that you have 10,000 of these ICD-9 terms and you have almost like a complete prediction engine already pre-computed in the graph. And then we do this for anything else you can think of. So a simple k-means clustering. Uh, yeah, you can have the, a particular cluster analytics, say k-means cluster. So here you see the metadata about the cluster. Here's the cluster one itself. You see the most important factors. Um, you see also here the patients that actually link back to these factors. And what you can even do, say this is a particular fa a patient that has both, well, the factor of diabetes, the patient has this particular symptom, and then I could even look again how these two factors link the database through odds ratios. So I can keep combining and combining. So that is the basics of how we model probabilistic um, knowledge in the database and how we visualize that. So. The next thing then is how do we deal with time? Yeah, because as you said, almost everything in life, well, everything in life is temporally bound. Yeah, everything begins and everything stops. So, and what we don't do, for example, if I want to say that I am the CEO of a company, you could just draw a link. You say A CEO of B. But then you don't see the time. You could use properties to put on there. But the, 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 the downside of using properties is that these properties cannot be objects themselves. They just can be strings. Yeah. So we have chosen for all temporal relationships to have an indirection object, a temporal object that links ob uh, entities together. Yeah. So I have a beautiful example here. Say I have all the legal entities in the country. Uh, so every person that works for a company and the companies themselves, we've got about 40 different types. And then we have temporal relations. So we could say that a person was the CEO for a company from a time T1 to T3. And you can also say that company C was located at, at a particular address from a certain time to this. Yeah, and we have this for a whole bunch of predicates. Instead of having direct relationship, we have temporal relationships between these entities. And so say you want to find out how a particular network is built up. Yeah, whether it's fraud or not, doesn't matter that much, but you want to look at the, the influence networks in your sets of entities. So let me give you an example there. Do this. And so say I have This this query where I say there is a person. Well, there is an object with the name this, and this person performs a role with respect to company one and company one, performs a role of full stock owner with respect to company two and company two 
performs a role of full stock owner with respect to company three. Yeah, and this is um, a, a very basic query that analysts do. And I can run the query, and here I get a graph. And it's actually a really nice graph, but again, you can't see it until you click on this. And now, let me remove this one, and let's look at the tree of this. And so now what you see, let me make it a little bit smaller. So now we see how we look at um, temporality. So we see that this person was an executive. This is European times, by the way, from August 1st yeah, to October 1st for this particular company here. This company became a full stock owner from this start time for this company. And this company was only stock owner from this time to this time here for this company. Then this company built up these companies, etc. And I can keep going and going and going and I could look at the role here. And keep expanding and expanding through a network. There's, I've seen networks that are more than 10 level deep, deep. Yeah. So this person is an executive for these and then we get all ownership relationships. Now these networks could actually build up over time. Yeah. So if you're an analyst and you look at this, it's already fantastic compared to what they could do, say, five years ago. But they still weren't happy because they couldn't see it, how these things were built up over time. So what we can also do is hit the button in this tool. And now I can look at the, the built up. I can go with my mouse here on temp time elements. And I can see there was a full stock ownership relationship that started here. Or I can actually drag this all the way to the left yeah, and tell a story with the graph. So I can see that at some point this person didn't have any influence yet and this company bought this company and I kept going. This foundation was started and then at some point this person became an executive for this company and then the next thing he does, he buys this company here and he becomes an executive for this company. And well, I don't want to bore you with the whole story, but here you see how slowly over time he builds up this whole influence, this network. And we use this technique for investor relationships um, in intelligence to see how communication is built up over time uh, in healthcare, yeah, how certain symptoms and, 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 uh, and, and diseases develop over time and or in influence networks in, in, uh, for entities. Yeah, so it's a beautiful technique to go through these through here. So um, actually, let me go here. Let me go back here. And even in this temporal example, we again use probabilistic relationships. So I could actually do this. So you have all these ent entities. Um, for one country, yeah. um, but you can take this any country in the world can almost do this, and you can also link these entities from your from this particular country and link them up to say the Panama Papers. Yeah, but the problem is going to be that um, that uh, 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 the names will be to spelled totally different in the Panama Papers than in your local database. And the addresses will also be totally different. So here, what we can, so here we have this, this this query that I personally think is one of the most beautiful queries I've ever writ written. Here I can say, is there an entity with a name that is similar to a Panama name? Yeah, that has this for a particular entity in the Panama Papers that has an address, yeah, with this particular name that is somewhat similar to the address here, yeah that was occupied at a particular point in time by this entity here. Yeah, and I can run the query. And so it's looking in the 300 million element facts right now to find all these different relationships. This was the, the, so you remember the circle query, it got translated into this, yeah. You get a visual graph here, and then you can look at the ultimate graph that you get, and what you would expect is all these tiny little circles, Okay, here, here you see the results. So 
this is the visual query, so the ex results that you expect are obviously also graphs. So we can look here. Yeah, and then you can, as an analyst, can look at any of these relationships that might interest you, because now at least you know that they're probably talking about the same. And then you can go bigger, and then you could start looking at a particular graph and see how people relate. All right, so let me go back to my um, broadcast, uh, the, the regular presentation. So I leave all these slides for you in the database, so you can see them later. And then, as I said, this approach of knowledge graphs works for almost any domain. We've applied it also to e-commerce, where we have Amazon and eBay and Google that sell products, yeah, where the entities are the products to be sold, and the events are the placement on their websites and portals, and where these placements have a particular start time when they got offered with prices, etc. But what you find is that people offer products, but they always use a slightly different description, different pictures, different quantities. So it's very hard for a consumer yeah, or for anyone who wants to do price comparisons. So we've done an approach. We now can take a particular product category and start comparing them over a whole set of websites and now find similarity measures between this. Yeah, so this is another domain. And then in the domain of intelligence, um, again, we we even mix temporality and probability in a in a what I think is a beautiful pattern. So, for example, we have a system, an event, a complex event processing system, on top of a knowledge graph around people of interest, where we can look at both time and probability to find if two bad people or two people of interest indirectly communicated within the 24 time periods. Yeah? So you get things like there's a person with the phone number that made a phone call to a phone that possibly belongs to this person, but this person is maybe the same person as this person, that that person is maybe a member of a criminal cell, it was an enemy from, a, from some point to another point for this criminal cell. And we know 100% certain that he was a member here and this person also had a possible meeting with this person here, maybe because they made, they were seen together or they made a phone call within 100 meters, within a minute time period, close to each other, yeah? And the system just created its own virtual event saying, well, maybe 0.2 that they actually had a meeting. And so we can go and find communication chains through time and through probability. Anyway, so this is the core of what I wanted to talk about. And then what we see in general, that people have all kinds of questions like, is this scalable? Can I do this with, why can't I do this with the property graph database? Or how easy is it to do the ETL? I don't want to go too deep to each of those, but this year, for this, when we talk about the scalability part, yeah, we created a new distributed architecture that we'll publish later this year that we're already using in various domains. But we'll make a production version out of it where because of the way we do our event handling, we can very easily partition part of our data over a cluster in shards. And there where we always still have some knowledge that you can't partition that we federate with each shard in the cluster. And with this architecture, I mean, you literally can do hundreds of billions of triples to trillions of triples. And so the reason this is hard to do with, say, a regular property graph database is that not really architected for partitioning and parallel queries. You have to deal with trillions of triples. And there's also no way, if we look at the medical example, that they can take all these medical taxonomies that are published as semantic data and link them into a property graph database. Remember, um, property graph databases work really well when you do graph analytics and they fit in memory. But as soon, if you want to, when the basic thing you're doing is integration, integrating information, yeah, then you need semantics to help you with that. So this is one thing. And then you could look at other systems like Janus Graph, and apart from the fact that they're not, well, the most 
important reason why you work with that in our system, it's also used for real-time decision support. So you literally want to do queries where you instantly get a result, yeah, in hundreds of, in, in, in milliseconds. Well, if you work with one of these big distributed stores, sometimes it just takes a second to set up the job structure for a graph for a Spark query. Yeah. So again, the, these these graph databases are great for certain types of analytics, but not for real-time decision support. And I could talk today more about ETL and why. Well, let me say a little bit about the ETL part. People always ask me, okay, so that's a great way to look at, um, to, to simplify your data, but isn't it very hard to do the ETL? And then my basic answer is, well, regularly with master data management, or if you make a regular knowledge graph where you just take the complexity of your input databases and turn it into a complex graph. Yeah, then you have to do a lot of hard work. But in our case, we take almost half of the complexity out just at the beginning because we can take, we can just map every type of thing in your silos directly to only one object. Yeah, where you have to make some decisions, but you can very easily create a visual UI around it to make that easy. And that's all I want to say about today.